Hi team, welcome to the Carb Appropriate Podcast where I talk to inspiring people in health, fitness, nutrition, business and the creative arts who are doing interesting things to improve performance and maximize human potential. Today I'm stoked to be talking to Dr. Dan Plews. Uh, he's a research fellow at AUT, probably most well known for his work on heart rate variability, um, but also more recently as a, a bit of a self-experimenter and doing a lot of work in the LCHF and fat adaptation space. He's also a weapon himself, having recently demolished the field in his age group at the Taupo New Zealand Ironman. Uh, I originally met Dan, I think, through mutual acquaintances at the Millennium Institute, AUT University. And uh, I was lucky enough to sit down a few times with Dan and have a chat about a range of stuff. And uh, you probably don't realize this, Dan, but I, I took a lot from those talks. You challenged a lot of my biases and and sort of preconceptions around a few things, hydration, electrolytes, and the fat adaptation space as well. And I really appreciated that. And I think that's really helped me to learn and grow in the last couple of years as a practitioner and researcher. So I'm super stoked to have you on the cast today. Uh, welcome along. No, awesome. Thanks for having me. I was thinking this, as you give me my introduction, I remember that before we actually met in person, you were one of those people who I always felt like I, I knew, but I never actually met. <laughs> Yeah, because your your name had been had, had been around so much, and uh, yeah, it was like Cliff Harvey, Cliff Harvey, Cliff Harvey. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I think I, I just had the um, the benefit of a little bit of time on feet. You know, obviously without the research shops that you've got, I I just got into the whole keto and low carb space so long ago. Um, I think at some point people are going to be annoyed enough to actually re to sort of know who you are and recognize what you're doing. Exactly. It's going to be hard <laughs> enough. I remember I was in um. You know the the cafe that's just by the Millennium there, the sip of the guys, the guy who owns that. He said, "Oh, Cliff Harvey's been harping on about low carb for years." <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there you go. And that's what you want. It's funny now because uh, I find that ha having been in the space for so long, but not you know being all keto all the time, kind of thing. As you know, my my approach is what I sort of call carb appropriate. Uh, it's interesting now because there are so many zealots in the low carb and keto space that I'm almost getting ostracized from the low carb community in some sectors, like I used to from the high carb community. Yeah. Because you're not, you're not low enough. Yeah, exactly, like, yeah. and, and they just say it has to be keto all the time. Yeah, yeah, it's nuts. It's um, I remember someone telling me that any um, nutrition is such a funny thing. It's almost like it's almost like a religion in many ways. You know, people get so passionate. You know, I'm a vegan, I'm a keto, I'm a low carb. But like, geez, in the end of the day, it's um, it's what is it's the thing that works best for you is the most important thing. And it's so uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, is it working? And if it is, keep doing it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of our, uh, obviously my listeners uh, may well have heard of you, I think. Um, I've certainly noticed your name popping up a, a lot in the last couple of years as someone who understands a lot about fat adaptation and the and particularly with respect to endurance. Um, but do you want to tell the listeners just a little bit about your background, where you came from, and how you sort of came to be doing what you're doing now? Yeah. Um, so my background is purely, um, so yeah, I guess my background is mainly as an athlete. So I grew up in the UK, um, and I started doing triathlon from a very, very early age. My dad was a, a pretty competitive age group triathlete, so I was in the British, like the British team, always national youth, national junior champion. Um, I went to Loughborough University, and I primarily went to Loughborough University as a, as an athlete more than anything. But I was studying um, sports science at the same time, and it was definitely that way around. I was there as an athlete with a bit of study on the side rather than rather than um, the way it should have been. Uh, so yeah, and then, um, but I was kind of doing the shorter distance events and but I never really made that leap. And at the time I was, there was a lot, you know, Britain now is quite well known, well known for kind of pretty good triathletes. So, so they were kind of upcoming and, you know, and it wasn't long before I realized I didn't really have what it takes um, probably to make it to the very highest level. Um, and then moved from there to Singapore, did a bit of triathlon coaching there for a short period. And then I started working for the um, Singapore Sports Institute, um, which is where I kind of went into more of the science sphere. Um, through that, I met my, who came to be, who's my good friend now, um, also a business partner, Paul Lawson. 
Um, so I met him in in universe um, in Singapore. He was coming over to New Zealand to do to be the head of physiology for high performance sport, and he said, "Hey, I've got a PhD opportunity for you if you were interested." And um, basically, I applied, and that was that. And then I came out came over to New Zealand, did my PhD, which was in heart rate variability, um, and and then yeah, worked for the New Zealand rowing team at the same time. Went to two Olympics with them. Went to um, Rio and um, London. And now I'm working um, as a contractor for Canoe Racing New Zealand, working with the women's program as well. So a bit of research, a bit of applied sports science, and a bit of um, self-experimentation myself in the triathlon world where I'm now pretty competitive going into the longer distances. So now I'm really involved in sort of the Ironman, more of the Ironman distance. It's pretty, pretty, pretty competitive, eh? Pretty competitive. <laughs> you know, when you get older, you've got to go longer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so... Yeah, I guess that that's that's kind of my my story in a in a short few words, but yeah. So. And it's funny. I mean, I'm laughing here because you're saying pretty competitive, and by all accounts, you are um, just killing it on on the course at the moment, putting in some amazing times, and and just smashing it at the age group level. Yeah, yeah, well, it's been, <laughs> yeah. It's been pretty good. It's, we had um so we had a we had a little girl um she was born in October same day as Kona Ironman in 2017 so being like it's a whole new level when you're working training for an Ironman and, and then you've got a uh, <laughs> an additional member who requires um, quite rightly a lot of your attention so now but that's that's been that's been pretty awesome so, and obviously like that's where my passion for the fat oxidation and the fat metabolism side comes from is um. I know how important that side of things is for for those sorts of ultra endurance events, and you know I was always typically a higher carb guy when I was younger, for sure. Um, definitely, especially in my uni days, I was definitely one of these people who was who trained a lot and wasn't super lean. Um, and then 2012, the person who when it really the person who got my attention was probably Tim Notes. You know, when he started harping on about it, I was like, oh god. You know, I've always respected what he says and I'm like, mm, maybe I should pay a bit of attention to this. And um, so there you go. In 2012, I was at, I actually started thinking, right, that's it. I'm going to go low carb. And I was actually in the Olympic Village at London. And I thought, right, that's it. I'm going to try and go low carb. And it was, you try going low carb in an Olympic Village. <laughs> Not easy. <laughs> no. So that that's really interesting because now Tim is obviously a bit of a pariah. What's your thoughts around where he's gone now and sort of where he's ended up do you do you think some of that's justified or do you think it's just people um not willing to pay attention to what's happening in the low carb space um what what do you what do you mean you so t what? tim obviously is is pretty heavily criticized um particularly amongst that sort of academic and the i guess academic come practitioner community and and how justified do you think that is well, I, I don't really think, I mean, I mean, I don't think it's, I don't think it is justified. I think it's been pretty heavily attacked for, a, you know, we're all, we're all, everyone's entitled to opinions and, and, and if you look at the low carb research, you can't really argue one way or the other. Like, and this is my point is that, you know, you can ostracize someone like Tim for being, taking a low carb approach, but show me the evidence where a high carb approach is better, you know? You know, yeah. you, you know, you can't argue, you know, it's hard to argue one way or the other. And there's a guy who himself has had a lot of personal success and seen a lot of success in that space. So um, I think like, you know, you get the, you know, you get the Louise, Louise Burton kind of that, that camp who are just, um, you know, that, that for some reason or whatever, the ketogenic diet must have done them a big wrong in their life because they're <laughs> so anti it. You know, and they're like, um, so, and I just don't think, um, but yeah, like, yeah, okay, all the elite athletes are on a higher carb diet, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's best. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be as high as that, like 600, 700 grams a day. That's just ridiculous. You know, yeah. and, and like, I know that like, and I've seen it all the time, nutritionists that will always talk about periodized nutrition, but in my lifetime, I've never in, ever seen a nutritionist do periodized nutrition. Properly. No. So. One thing that we discussed a lot, uh, you know, I discussed this with, with Joe uh, McQuillan and, you know, Karen and Grant and all the team up there that I spent a lot of time with 
it's really interesting when you start going back to you know food reporting and how food is either poorly reported or uh, with a lot of the food reporting around elite athletes mm. often even if they're eating a high carb diet it's still under what the recommendations are yeah, and yeah. so typically the conclusion in those papers is well even though these are elite athletes they're still not eating enough carbohydrate Whereas I take that to sort of mean, well, if consistently almost all of the top athletes are not eating recommendation, even if they are eating high carb, yeah. maybe the recommendations are a little bit high. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Who, who, there was, I went to, a, I forgot the name of the guy, but I was at a presentation, he was putting that data on footballers, and he was basically said that, you know, they just do not eat that that amount, you know? Yeah. So, and like, I think, and it's exactly like, like the polarized training kind of area as well. <clears throat> You know, that pol the polarized training, so the majority of your training is at a low intensity with a little bit of high intensity. That's based on what do the best um, the best athletes in the world, how do they train? And that's how the polarized training areas come about. And then people have researched that and they found that, okay, if someone does a threshold model, someone does a polarized model, yes, the polarized model seems to win out. But like it's just impossible to have those massively to do that within the diet space without you know for weeks and weeks on end and do it properly and do it controlled um so yeah yeah, yeah exactly i mean I, I look at the i didn't really know really what the guidelines were back in the day because i, I think i forgot them pretty quickly after learning them at university <laughs> yeah. and Subject, you're very subjective yeah. <laughs> yeah. i wasn't and i wasn't an endurance oh. athlete obviously but I, I remember as a weightlifter who was supposed to eat a lot of carbohydrate. I, I literally could not eat the amount of carbohydrate that was being prescribed. I mean, I have Crohn's disease, so that causes a bit of a challenge there as well. But it was just, it would have been impossible for me to eat, you know, upwards of 400 grams of carbohydrate per day. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I mean, that's um, that's my story in, in the carbohydrate space. And it's been, it's been awesome. Like, it's definitely changed my definitely changed my performance i've become a better athlete whether it's whether it's a training whether it's age whether it's diet something's happened i'm you know i'm doing better i'm doing better over the longer distances um more productive and all the all the normal things that i find yeah just just help i can't say i don't get hungry anymore but i think that's you know if you're training 20 hours a week you know and you're trying to work you just like sometimes i'm just like Get me some food. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you, you kind of want to get hungry sometimes, right? That's a good natural response. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, some of these, like, I don't feel hungry anymore. I'm like, yeah, that's not me. <laughs> yeah. That's my wife. Do you think she can never feel me? <laughs> well, interestingly, and this is a bit of an aside, and then I'll get back on track, but uh, one thing that we've actually noticed lately clinically, and we need to obviously do a bit more investigation on this, is for some people, that's actually a negative of being on a, a really low carb diet, particularly if that's a really low carb pretty high protein diet is they're almost oversatiated if they're a particular type that requires um you know more calories particularly let's say people with Gilbert's Jal syndrome and things like that who really want to keep the calories up yeah yeah they're so satiated they end up under eating consistently yeah. and they end up burning up that's one of, and that's one of the dangers with i think that i mean that's one of the dangers with the kind of the more the pro the, the pro guys who are doing because i work with a lot of pro ironmen who kind of get more into the keto like it does make you do generally get less hungry and also like if you're trying to push that fat adaptation and you're going longer you're doing rides without eating you, know, you can be talking like four or five hours of the day when you're not taking any food and yeah. you know, and that the problem is is when you get into that negative energy balance space you know and, uh, and i think it's like i only really work with males um and obviously, negative, negative negative energy balance of female athlete triad. It's a kind of a known um, thing in in females, but it's massively overlooked in males. Yeah, people just don't even think about it. But like, like the that whole cascade of um, low energy availability, lower testosterone, bone de lower in bone density, and all that kind of thing. It's just it's not really con considered as much. But I think it's actually people need to stand up and pay attention. Like there was a paper released recently that showed if you're 400 calories in deficit um, a day, you're in serious um, risk of lowering your testosterone. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's that's been demonstrated for a long time, right? That um, 
free T to cortisol ratio and how that's got such a good predictive value for, uh, you know, overreaching, overtraining and how that's massively, you know, the biggest effector of that is, is calorie balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, I mean, and it's very easy to be 400 calories for a, for a guy who's training between 20 and 30 hours a week, like so easy to be 400 calories um, under, especially if you're trying to push fat adaptation and you're trying, you're purposely trying not to eat during exercise as much as, you know, not because I think meeting the demands of exercise is not great. So it's kind of like it's a real um, seesaw of where you're trying to maximize the gains of the adaptation, but minimize the risk of any kind of endocrinological or or overeating status. So. Yeah. So you're in a pretty interesting position because, you you know, I know that you're sort of speaking from the position of this is what works for me and this is what I've tried and this is what I've done. But you're in a pretty unique situation of being not just an athlete, you're a coach and you're a researcher. So you've looked in greater depth at this, you know, in this topic than most people I think would have ever done really because it's such a new sort of area. You've recently, uh, you co-authored a paper uh, which was I really enjoyed about that sort of spectrum of, I, I guess, fuel provision for endurance athletes. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I guess uh, the different horses on the same courses, which is one of with one of my PhD students, Ed, um, Ed Maunder. So and he, so I came to Ed with this idea, and he's really into his substrate stuff, and he's like, yeah, that's that's all me. I'll and he, he's he's a genius. He like he bashed it out in about a week. Um, <laughs> So, but yeah, the, the the idea was is that I kind of like because I'm in the space where I'm I do it myself. I read a lot of the research, and and I just feel that people get they get the message a bit wrong sometimes. Is that you know it's it's one or the other, you know. And I read on blogs, and people will say, oh, you know, I've been on a low carb ketogenic diet, and my marathon time wasn't any slower when I wasn't didn't taking any carbs. And I'm like, well, yeah, you took six hours to do the marathon, though, didn't you? <laughs> like, you know, like, like it's not um like that's not the point like you you know and i'm you know to, to, within a certain if you go over a certain intensity some carbohydrate is will be required and that's where it comes in is that you know this kind of train low race high approach for elites at least i believe is the best way forward because fat oxidation is undeniably absolutely critical because when it comes to endurance i man the thing that's going to be stopping you is running out of endogen and endogenous carbohydrate supplies right so you're trying to keep them topped up as much as you can so the ways you can do that is either not use them or put them in so they're the two things that you want to do um and the best way to not use them is increase your fat oxidation the best way and then the other side of it is then also put them in and so I wanted to just show that once you go over a certain, no, no matter how high your fat oxidation is, even if it's at 1.5, 1.6 grams per minute, you you cannot meet the energy demands when of some of the elite guys, like when you're doing 315 watts for five hours, for example, on a bike, mm -hmm. you cannot meet those demands. So, um, and that's what I wanted to show. But on the other side, if you're going a lot slower and you're at the kind of the lower end age group level, yeah, it's possible because energy demand isn't as high so you could if you wanted to you could you can train low carb and you can race low carb but once you get over a certain time i think the benefit is that you train low carb build the fat oxidation and then you race high um, yeah. yeah i mean that seems to be such a common thing that's done now and it's only a very recent sort of you know it's a very recent strategy i think for people yeah. like me, but I would say most of the athletes that I work with are doing that. Yeah, it's surprising that it's only recent, but it could because to me it's always been so obvious. You know? Yeah, I think one of the interesting things is that people are actually beginning to now understand the spectrum of of low carb or the spectrum of carb intake, full stop, and the spectrum that is fuel creation within the body you know particularly yeah. with respect to ketogenesis um i i talked about this with steve finney years ago and there was still this idea that ketosis was kind of like an on off switch and i've always sort of thought that doesn't make any sense because we no matter how much carbohydrate you eat we always produce ketones you know yeah, yeah, yeah. but we we produce small amounts and we turn them over very quickly and so you might exhibit 0.1 millimoles of 
beta hydroxybutyrate if you're on a high carb diet and then that goes up the lower the carb intake and the higher the fat intake you know so over years you know over 20 odd years i've been measuring people doing like paleo diets and primal diets and stuff and they often exhibit 0.3 0.4 you know they're not quite in ketosis per se but they're still at a level of ketonemia which is not consistent with the norm yeah and obviously you go lower and they're higher so it's interesting because there is is a spectrum there yeah and the one thing that's always i've always thought about no one's i don't know you might be able to answer the question is that and i was thinking about this when i was writing that paper is when you're exercising for a long period say eight nine hours and you're taking in carbs what is the level of ketone at that time because like you know exercise induced ketosis definitely you know when i i I will often measure my ketones post exercise and they're always high Mm -hmm. Um, generally i'm not eating i've never really done it when i've been you know after a um after a i have measured my blood glucose though and generally my blood glucose is pretty high after i've done a pretty you know, after I finish an Ironman, it's high, but I wonder what the, that level is because I would still imagine that for someone like me who's a good fat burner, so my fat, my grams per minute is about 1.3 grams per minute, which is, uh, so, so that, I mean, that's up there. Um, so I would imagine even if I take in the carb, I would probably still have reasonably high ketones. And I think that's the point that you want to get to. Absolutely. And, and having that mixed fuel availability, I mean, one thing that I've often discussed with people and they tend to think I'm crazy is, you know, when people talk about fat adapted, they usually think, well, that means the person has to be on an extremely low carb diet. Whereas to my mind, I say, well, all that means is that your body can utilize fat really effectively. So, you know, your RER or whatever other measure you're taking shows that. You could be on a really high carb diet and be a very fat adapted athlete if you burnish a ton of fat, right? Could be, yeah. And um, and I know, like you know, and that's you know, guys who are guys who are elite and do a lot of training, they will be. So lots of them, even though they are on a high carb diet, they will be very fat adapted. Right? Yeah, it's just that's what exercise does, and that's why there's that direct relationship between VO two max and fat oxidation. It's pretty much a point nine point nine relationship. So the more your VO2 goes up, the better your fat oxidation because the mitochondria is such a key place. It's a critical role in the, um, the beta oxidation. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, you've, you've mentioned the train low, race high, you know, methodology. How do you actually apply that? What would a day, a, a day's eating look like for you? And how would that, uh, how would your race fueling really differ from that? Yeah. Um, so like, I guess I have I have probably changed a little bit from when I first started to a little bit more keto to I would say I'm a bit more paleo now. Yeah. And I've just I've just found that and I say this with lots of the athletes that I work with now, like I think unless you unless you're an elite, I don't think going keto is a good a good point, um, a good starting point. I think going into more of a kind of a paleo so you know in like the real meal revolution they've got the green and the red and the the um amber kind of colors yeah my theory i think that if you're uh, if you're training a lot the amber's okay go for those you know so you've got kind of your carrots i mean i wouldn't say i eat cum like potato or anything but i will have beetroot parsnip some of those more rooty rooty vegetables and i've, I've kind of added that in a little bit more and i've added in a little bit more fruit just just because, like, you know, I measure my fat oxidation all the time, and it doesn't. It's not going anywhere. So, yeah. <laughs> so why, why not, why not have it? But then, um, so, so yeah. So I will include that in my diet. I also, I also take my blood glucose every morning. Um, okay. Just out of interest, really. Um, and uh, I'm always like four point three, four point four. So, wow. Huh. I don't have anything to kind of be concerned about in that in that sphere but yeah i mean a typical day would like so say this morning i um i would get i got up i had a a bulletproof coffee um like so coffee with butter and a bit of mct yeah um that i bought from you in fact (laughs) (laughs) okay good we'll we'll, we'll plug that in the show notes yeah 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 Yeah, i think i think it's a kickstarter oh no it's a go longer the go longer the mct um, I'll tell you what, I, I mean, I'm just going to do a bit, of, a bit of an aside here. I was skeptical when um, 
we looked at that product, but it, it's actually really good. And mm. one thing we've noticed is as compared to some other brands, it's weird, but there seems to be less GI distress from it. Mm. And it, it's a yeah, really it's super high quality product. Yeah. I won't go on about it here because it's not the space, but it's a it's a great product. Yeah. So well, we can talk about MCTs and uh, we all, all yeah, but look, just 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 before we go on for the MCTs, I found that the powder was um, easily the best on my gut, but it's difficult to get the powder without a bit of glucose in there. I found so. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask your opinion on that actually, because a lot of people say that, and I haven't tried. Well, I have actually tried some powders, but um, mm. so not I tried a lot. My protein MCT powder, and I found it was like really good on my gut, like better than most. Um, Even if you dose match the exact amount of MCT. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I found it was a bit better, but I also found, but it's also got a bit of carb in it. So, yeah. I don't know it was as good. So, oh, yeah. So, I had MCT coffee. Um, I have put collagen in my coffee as well. Yep. The Great Lakes. And then I'll take a vitamin C with it as well, just to, it's first thing in the morning and I'm all over that. So, the, you know, yeah. in the Keith Bar stuff about the collagen. Fortunately, I've got a bit of an injury at the moment, so it's not working for me. But <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I then I did um, then I went down into my garage. I did a, a bike session um, and a bit of a running run on the treadmill. And then I came up and I had and that's the point where I'll eat some food. And I had some scrambled eggs and some leftovers from the night before, which was just Brussels sprouts and um, um, sweet. What will people call it? Pumpkin butternut squash. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, and that's that's kind of a breakfast then, and then in the uh, yeah, and then I'll kind of just go through the day, have a coffee, have sometimes I'll have a like I'm I'm sponsored by S Fuels, which is um I think you've I've talked to them about you before, um which is kind of it's a it's a low carb bar, um yeah. a sports bar, so I often will snack on one of them if I get a bit hungry, which I sometimes do in the in the um about ten o'clock, and then yeah, and then it's just lunch, and that's pretty much it really, and then. I, like the lunch was the lunch was some um, was again some leftovers from from a couple of days ago, but like generally, that's the way where I roll really. Then the evening time will be a salad and a and a meat, you know, and I'll kind of alternate between salmon, steak, and and a white fish pretty much. I don't really and sometimes chicken, yeah. So, so it's still still pretty low carb. Yeah, it's still pretty low carb. It's just but in the evenings in the salads we'll often put in. Um, like beetroot or you know so that would that would knock me out of ketosis of like beetroot or or putting up squash or something like that yeah mm -hmm. that, that that's enough to knock knock me out i mean we, i think we've had this conversation before is that i'm easily knocked out of ketosis i have to be pretty yeah pretty low i do find though that if i my, my ketones will be pretty high after if i go out riding in the morning and do three hours and i don't eat i can come back and i can be at three millimoles you know and then wow yeah, and then I'll be, and then I'll be like, pretty much. If I don't have something quite carby, um, I'll be in that pretty much that the whole day. Um, sometimes I will have a protein shake after a train if it's a really hard session. Um, and I f also find that the protein shake would knock me out if I wanted to knock me out. But I'm not, like I say, I'm not. I don't really care whether yeah. I have ketosis or not. Um, the main reason I measure my ketones is like I kind of give it as a proxy measure of. Uh, how much I'm burning fat? Yeah. How much? How much? How deep am I going into fat burning? You know. So. Yeah, it's it's interesting when you say you don't care. I think a lot of a lot of people need to, you know, have that measure because it almost gamifies the experience. Yeah. Um, but having mucked around with keto and doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things for so long, I, I'm like you. I just don't care because. Yeah. I, I know that I'm going to be flexible. You know, I don't know if I ever showed you that stuff I did, but I was eating. I was doing some carb backloading as an experiment, and eating around 200 to, to 250 grams of carbohydrate in the evening after dinner. Yeah. And yeah. I was eating all sorts of stuff, awesome. and then by the next lunchtime, I was basically back at 0.7 so not deep yeah. ketosis but certainly in ketosis but that's it that's enough right and like i, I think and I, I, that's like, the jury's out on what's optimal right and i think you know this and i remember listening to um peter atia and someone's asking oh what's the optimal level of ketosis and it's like well that's like a ridiculous question the optimal level is the best way to find out is that when you're in when you're on a low carb diet have your ketone meter with you and when you feel really good, really alert, really on it, take your blood ketones. 
And if it's at 0.7, that's right. If it's at one, yeah. that's right. And like, so me and me and Paul Wilson, me and Prof, like, you know, we ha we hang out a lot together, and we're a real set of geeks. And um, you know, we 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 would all, we'd come back from a rise, and we'd be picking up any others. They watch your blood ketones. You know, we'd have we'd have like Dexcoms in our stomach and taking our blood ketones and comparing. And like me and him, <laughs> night and day, we were so different. Um, you know, he was way higher than me all the yeah. time. In the mornings, well, I like in the mornings. I'd wake up with about point two, and he'd be like two, one. You know, we'd be, <laughs> we'd be eating the same thing. We'd be, you know, we're, we're hanging out together all the time. We pretty much ate the same, but it's just it's completely different of of how um, your body uses uses the ketones and also creates carbohydrate. So yeah, I would say that you know, Prof will agree that I'm a little bit more highly trained than him. So perhaps I'm actually better at finding carbohydrate from you know um gluconeogenesis and other things like that and even the breakdown of lipolysis you know the gl glycerol molecule it will actually you know you'll actually break down um you will actually find some carb right so exactly i actually read and this 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 hasn't been investigated yet but there's uh in silico models suggest that there is a plausible uh, conversion of fatty acids to glucose as well which mm -hmm. obviously everyone thought was crazy for so long but that's what the in silico models suggest. So if they can start to replicate that, um, you know, obviously in vitro and vivo, then that'll be pretty amazing as well yeah. because different people may be able to do it. It, it wouldn't surprise me either. I mean, the, the Volek FASTA study, I mean, the fact that the glycogen content was the same, the muscle glycogen content was the same in all groups before exercise, you know that's that's like well that's a bit that's a bit crazy. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, they're not eating any carb, but they're getting it from somewhere. So, yeah. I think the the points you make about beta hydroxybutyrate levels are are really important. I think uh, I often get questions from the same question from my students, right? How how deep should I be, kind of thing? How you know what should my levels of ketones be? And often people are trying to chase higher and higher numbers. And I always say, would you be chasing higher numbers with glucose? Like, yeah, of yeah. Of course, I wouldn't. Yeah. And although I know, I understand there, there's differences there. There still is going to be a point where simply chasing a higher number is not going to be beneficial. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, at the end of the day, it's about total substrate. So if you're taking your blood glucose and your ketones at the same time, and you're, you know, like if your blood glucose is super low, then okay, maybe ketones needs to be a bit higher. But if, you know. I think it, the, the total substrate is the thing that makes you feel good, and a little yeah. bit. Of, and I think a, a mix between the two is the best. You know, you don't want to be really high on one and really high on the other, really low on one and really on the other. That's that's my that's my, what my gut tells me. So I yeah. remember, I remember the, I remember um, me and me and me and Prof were in Rotorua, and we did we did a five hour ride in the morning, um, and it included four 40 minute efforts and um at ironman pace so it was pretty it was pretty big and, and what happened was it was we we ended up timing it a bit wrong so we finished our last 40 minute effort and we were still like 30 k's from home and we had no food and we were and it was like oh well we, we always we came back and we we had one piece of banana bread um because we actually had a bit of car <laughs> in, in taupo because so we started from road road to taupo and then pretty much back um and then and then we took we had one piece of banana bread we mistimed it we came in, we ate some food, and then I was like, well, all right, let's go for a swim. So we went up to the Blue Lakes, and we had a very short swim. And I was swimming up and down, and, and, I, swam, and I swam past Prof, and he's like, and I'm like, Prof, you look like a floating tweak. He was going so slow. <laughs> he was so tired. And anyway, so long story short, we got back to where we were staying, and, um, and he took his glucose and his ketones and, and ketones, and his glucose was like at three. And his blood ketones were at 4.5. And wow. he felt terrible. <laughs> Just to me, he goes to me, word of warning, when your ketones are higher than the blood glucose, you don't feel good. <laughs> yeah. We've, um, we saw that in our MCT study. Uh, one of the participants didn't um, let us know, and, and we didn't catch it. But thankfully, um, well, so basically she had a low blood glucose reading, so low on the blood glucometer yeah and i don't know exactly how low that is but I, it's got to be under three um, yeah, right, okay. 
because it, well, at some point it just gives you a low reading, which is basically go and see your doctor straight away yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, 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 because it gives you. So yeah, well, well, I'll let you finish the story because I've got I've got a bit more to add to this interesting story too. Oh, but thankfully her blood ketones were high enough that yeah. she didn't have a hypochoma or anything like that. Exactly, and that's the amazing thing is that so me and me and Terenzo, uh, Terenzo Bizzoni, who's probably people might know, is a bit. You think I'm a weapon of an athlete? He's a absolute weapon of an athlete um he's the ultimate like weapon um so we went to kona and before we went to kona we did um some like some trials pre-post and we were taking our um, blue glucose during basically it was just a we did a max test um and then we did not quite to max it was pretty high level then we did like 60 minutes continuous at 260 watts um and like our blue glucose in the middle of the test was like 3.8, 3.7, like, you know, and we were like, you know, we're totally, totally fine, like normal. And the nutritionist at the time, and he goes, is that, is that okay? And I'm like, well, I'm talking to you, aren't I? You know, I'm not <laughs> going off my bike. I'm not, you know, so there was obviously, and I said to him, I said to him, that's clearly not the only substrate running through my veins right now. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, that's the key, right? And that's what you, you mean, um, you know, when you're talking about that total, yeah fuel and total fuel availability that's that's the critically important thing yeah exactly yeah yeah so what does that mean for you when you're uh, doing an event then what how how does your fueling strategy during the event work yeah so i mean then, then everything changes right so then i'm going for performance there's a website that says um there's a website called slow twitch and their motto is i think it's slow twitch it says um it's race day it's time to treat your body like a rental car <laughs> and that's kind of the approach I take is that when it's um, on race day, it's all on. Like, so I'll put, you know, I'm, and I and I'll try and match. I'll try and basically take as much carb as I can physically take, whilst my gut will, will or what my gut will t gut will tolerate, um, which is pretty much sixty grams per hour. Um, okay. So, and that's I don't. I'm not mixing fruit, um, fructose, and anything multidextrin or anything in glucose. I'm just pure multidextrin on that. Um, I find that's easiest on my gut. Um, yeah. And pretty much 20 grams, 20 grams every 20 minutes. So it works out to be nice. And huh. and I'm generally, generally okay on that. But the, the cool thing about being fat adapted is that if I miss a feed, um, that's not the end of the world, right? So I'm totally, I'm fine. Like, and, and when I do the Ironman, I'll, during the run, I don't worry about it too much. I'll just, um, I'll try and make sure that I'm fully doing as much as I can on the bike. And then on the run, I'll, you know, because it's quite hard to get things when you're running for race stations and, and whatnot. So um, I'll just grab what I can. I'll grab a gel. I think this year in Taupo, I ran a, I ran a 252 marathon. And I only took two gels. Um, hmm. And then the rest I just grabbed, which is like 60 grams of carbs over three, I think it's 60 grams, yeah, over three hours, just under three hours. Um, so it definitely wasn't meeting any demands there. Um, but what was good is that during the bike, I was 60 grams per hour pretty. Yeah. Much. I was actually a little bit under because I, when I got to my bike the, the day after, I was, um, I had um, a little bit of food left in my little food pouch so i was must have been a little bit under but that's that's kind of the approach that i, I will take and that's why glucose can be in the nines tens when i finish i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah. coke. and if, if it's absorbed all the coke in because i'm grabbing coke from the a stations and yeah yeah i think so but i mean a lot of those those um high levels is just the hgo right the um, hepatic glucose output yeah 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 but it's like, even I mean, I mean the funny thing is is that it is, but at the same time, like I'm at a low intensity, right? It's not mm. a high intensity exercise, but there's still there's still something that's giving off a lot of blood glucose. So if I go out for a long four hour ride, for example, um, I will. I mean, I won't. I won't have a high blood glucose after that. the intensity is low enough. Yeah. Um, but if but in an Ironman, I think there's the intensity is still low. But because there's so much other stuff going on, the intake of food, the muscle damage, the inflammation, and all that kind of thing, then it just goes woof. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I did a really interesting YouTube clip, and I showed my blood glucose levels um, days after a half Ironman, and you wouldn't believe how long it took for it to come back down. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, it, was, it took me – I can't say I was being, like, 
super strict. Like, you know, I kind of finished the race and I was a little bit, a little bit more laissez faire than I normally would be. Um, but it still took a, a reasonable time for it to come back down into the five. So, so do you think to, to some, would that to some degree be a combination of hepatic glucose output and gluconeogenesis to replete muscle glycogen, do you think, or is there something else going on? Post race? Yeah. Um, I think it's um, a bit of that, but I also think it's a little bit of just inflammation and stress. You know, I, mm. I, you know, I have a lot of the athletes that I coach, some of them, you wouldn't believe the relationship between overreaching and overdoing it and high intensity training and stress and blood glucose. Because at the end of the day, blood glucose is inflammatory, right? Like um, glucocorticoid, right? It's mm. a stress hormone called glucocorticoid for a reason. It's it's, it's kind of it's kind of mediated by glucose. So, um, and I think that's something that's that's going on a little bit there. Is the overall level of a stress of a race in general um, would cause a bit of a glucose rise the next the next for the preceding days because you just yeah. so. And that's where you know, like the when it comes to training, doing lots of high intensity interval training and kind of this mid zone training that's kind of not hard, not easy. I, that, it might not be that beneficial from a health perspective, you know. So that's why you know doing easy stuff most of the time, aerobic, low heart rate, kind of the, the kind of the kind of the more Phil Mathetone, the math method. Have you heard of that? Yeah, no, I've actually heard a lot of um, a lot of top level athletes talking about that recently. Is yeah. to, to sort of be at either end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Phil Mathetone, he was he did a lot of work with Mark Allen back in the day, and he. He's he talks about the mathetone heart the math heart rate. Yeah. It sounds like he's naming it after himself, but it's not. It's called maximum aerobic fitness. I think is the what it stands for. Um but anyway, that's a basically it's a level like a heart rate and it's it's 180 minus your age, and he says that that's kind of if you're doing your long, slow stuff, the slow endurance, that's the level you should be below. And for most endurance guys, that's easy. Like I would I mean for me, that's not a challenge at all for me to go and run at 180 minus my age. Like that's, I can I could run I could clip along at four minute k's doing that. Yeah. Um, but, but the for the untrained and the the new people to the sport, that's not the case, and that's where they would really benefit from keeping the heart rate low. And why a lot of people who start become burned out quite easily because they're just, you know, because they've kind of got this sympathetic stress is, um, you know, the overall inflammation that's caused by just doing that slightly higher intensity work. Yeah. Hey, so I, I want to take a step back. Do, do you take uh, any MCTs or, or ketones before or during training and events as well, or, or is that not something? Yeah, that's I, take, I, yeah I do. I, so training wise, um, I do take ketones. Um, I'll take two things when I'm training. I'll either take the S-Fuels. S-Fuels are brought out kind of a fat drink. It's, not okay. not, it's, got, it's, got, it's basically fat and uh, electrolyzed, so I'll take that. Um, just because, and the main reason being is, like we talked about before, is that I don't want any insulin spike when I'm exercising. I don't want any fat oxidation to be shut down, and I want it to be something clean that I'm taking. I want to keep low carb. But at the same time, I don't necessarily want to... Um, run the risk of a negative energy balance so at least i know i'm getting some energy some kind of nutrients into my system so that's one thing that i will drink often when i'm ex when i'm training and the other thing is um, i will take ketones usually mm -hmm. i take the salts because they're just the ones that are most easily accessible in training um and the main reason i take that especially if i haven't done training in a while or i'm i'm going i'm going quite low i just find it i mean Terenzo talked about this a lot find it just takes the edge off a little bit like in terms of that hunger and the the knock yeah um and and you know you you look at the research in terms of what's out there at the moment and we publish research in the ketone salts as well um and it's quite you know it's quite hard to say that it actually does anything but yeah i really do think it has its place when in that situation where you're you're going low you're training your ketones, you know, you're at that period where your ketones aren't quite ramped up. Yeah, and it's just enough, you know, to take you from 0.5 to 0.8, you know, that makes a difference and that makes yeah. you feel that a little bit better. And I think that's where they have their place. Not necessarily, it's not going to necessarily make you 
perform any better, but it can just take the edge off. Yeah, and what, what a lot of our athletes are saying as well is that it doesn't actually help them go any faster. What it does is it helps them feel a heck of a lot better yeah, while they're yeah. doing it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. You know, yeah. with the cognitive benefits and things like that. I'm also pretty interested in, in the differences between the, you know, a lot of the commonly available salts out there, which are that racemic sort of blend, you know, so they're the yeah. L&D beta-hydroxybutyrate versus the uh, formulas now that are just yeah, 100%. So, so I guess it's the, uh, because, the, I mean, now there's so many different ones out there. There's the racemic form, which is like the Donald Augustino kind of, he's, he's more of the racemic ketones, isn't he? Uh, he's more in favor of the just the D um, because that's yeah. the native form in the body, yeah. Yeah, which is racemic, is that right? Am I being oh, yeah, so I, I mean the, the the mixtures of the L&D because yeah. most formulas out there are that 50-50 yeah. racemic mixture of L&D, yeah. that I'd right, yeah. So, and then, so there's his mix, there's the salts, and then now there's the monoester, which is the, which is both, right? Which is the best of both worlds, supposedly. Um, and that seems to ramp the ketones up super high. Um, but my understanding is that the 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 ketone ester that Dom D'Agostino um, uses is he he he's is, that's more for um, like cancer and cognitive function and all those sorts of things rather than exercise performance. So, did you read the Lecky paper that was that used that in the cyclists? That it was, was in it? The, it was a Lecky paper that was on. Um, Use the ester in cycling performance. Did that show a negative effect? Yeah, it had. It was Lecky, Louise Burke, Mark Quad, I think, um, a few, a few of those guys. Yeah, but like, yeah, it just it was such an appalling study. Yeah, uh, Dom and uh, and his colleagues published a rebuttal. No, yeah, really they, good points. Yeah, I mean, if you if you if they wanted to design a study that was going to fail, that's a study that you would. I mean, even the title, they may as well have just gone, you know, vomiting and diarrhea causes you to cycle slower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know, like, it's just like, God, you don't even test the doses just here. So it was like that low carb, um, you know, ketogenic diet and peers performance study that came out a few months back, and it was a um, four day ketogenic diet oh, and, yeah. and then a time trial. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Four day fast followed by a time trial. What's going to happen? <laughs> Ketosis impairs performance. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so yeah, but, but then um, just to finish the, on the point of the ketones, but then during racing, I will, um, I'll take an ester. Yep. Yeah. Because my, because I think the salts can cause you a bit of like, can, you can become a bit unstuck in racing if you're taking a lot of the salts just because of the permeability of the gut and the, and yeah. they are loaded with sodium. So, you know, you, you, you can easily overdo it on that, and which changes the thirst response and all that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, so that's what, what I'll, um, the bit, the esters are quite hard to get hold of. I've actually used a real ester and I've used the one, three butane dial. Yep. Um, again, the jury's out whether that actually does anything, but I kind of like it and I've used it in a lot of races and I seem to go well with it. So yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting space in the next couple of years because obviously, you know, I've been contacted by a few of the companies that are starting to make, um, you know, publicly accessible ketone esters now. Yeah. And I just think, you know, it, it's again, it's going to be a little bit like your horses for courses type idea that yeah. you had around the diet. I think what you're going to use or if you're going to use it at all is so dependent on the situation, who you are. Yeah, situation. exactly. And what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. You know, again, go back to the, the levels thing, the levels yeah. of ketones. We were nearly bumped back in one of our papers that we just published because the reviewer would not budge on the position that to be in ketosis, you have to be above two or three millimoles. And we can, you know, we could only conclude that the reviewer, we didn't know who, who it was, obviously, but we could only conclude that he, we assume it was a he as well, that the reviewer <laughs> was a, an old... Um, doctor in the field of epilepsy because that's obviously what you'd be looking at for acute optimal acute seizure control is over two or three millimoles yeah but our point was that no one applies that anymore it's basically in the mainstream which was what our population was we're really looking at much lower levels because as you suggested that's where people begin to see you know improvement or moderation of performance and they start to feel better and all those types of things yeah 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 i mean yeah the like the ketone space, the uh, you know, the, the exogenous ketone spaces, is 
super fascinating and um so i want to i'm going to try and get my hands on some of the human ketone stuff so um you know the mono ester and i think that's yeah. probably where it has its best but that's probably where it's going to have an effect um i do have a few worries about you know i i also worry about almost like, too much substrate available at one go you know like that, that concept Absolutely. Well, your body like what the hell carbohydrate and ketone all in one go like you know what's that actually going to do to yeah. the fat? so um but like i was it you know the the point i want i would say with the ketones is like again the exogenous stuff there's there's again there's two camps right there's the people who think what a pile of crap that's never going to work and then there's the people who you know who say it would work and I think the evidence at the moment for most ketones, apart from like the co some of the, the the human ketone stuff, which is from like the Cox group, which shows that they're showing that it, their studies show that it does actually work, and you know, ketones are really high when they take it. But like ketones are so much in their infancy. Like mm -hmm. if you think about back 20, 30 years when people were first supplementing with carbohydrate, how long did it take for people to actually understand how to use? carbohydrates during exercise, the right mixes, the fructose, the maltodextrin, the glucose, the galactose, all these different things. I mean, I don't know if you are familiar with some of the galactose, some of those earlier sports drinks, the galactose, which was kind of like more of a low GI kind of releasing. You know, it just caused everyone to basically crap the pants, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then people go, oh, okay, maybe this isn't the best form of yeah, carbohydrate. Yeah. People didn't go, oh, carbohydrates don't work. It's about finding... <laughs> right mix of ketones in the right situations, the right blends, the right monoesters and diesters, the L form, the B form, whatever, you know, the D form, whatever um, is, but like they're just, I and mean, that's what's cool is that we're fortunate that um, we are alive and researching at a time when this is happening. That's yeah. what I think is quite cool, so. Yeah, I think it's a super fascinating field and, uh, you know, I'm giving a talk next month on, uh, ketosis for, for cancer, for example. And I think that's a, an area where exogenous ketones could end up being really beneficial because you don't need to be as aggressive with, with diet and things like that. But there's a lot of fish hooks in the cancer space as well. You know, to, to simply say that keto diets or ketones should be applied for all cancers is crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's why, yeah, and that's why people like Don D'Agostino are doing such um, great work in that, in that space, right? And, you know, like even, in, even with kids and epilepsy and you can't expect a, a child to go on a ketogenic diet like it's not going to happen right so there's so there's um nuances and really good stuff to be had in in that space you know? and again at the end of the day like you know i always think we talk about you know our passion is sport but it's such a small i mean and that's where i think of the ketone stuff but it's so insignificant in what it could actually do for the, the yeah. world so hmm. And I mean, I'm seeing that, you know, one of the things that I often talk about is forget about to some degree what ketones are actually doing in the body. For a lot of people, they function as a tool that allows them to have, we think at least, you know, based on what I've seen, fewer cravings and might have uh, helped them to eat within restricted time feeding windows. They eat less overall. Yeah. They've basically got a tool that helps them to adhere to diet more effectively. And we all know that adherence and compliance is the key above anything else yeah exactly yeah, yeah. So, so um what are some of your key because you you obviously do a lot of reading you know you're uh right up there in that space what are some of your go-to resources and readings and things who do you typically tend to go to to get your information i'm a, I'm a big podcast listener i think we talked about that before um as you say my, my go-to po podcast i like the joe rogan podcast yeah um, quite a lot and like, uh, who else have we been listening to? STEM Talks, have you heard of that that podcast, STEM Talks? That's another really good one that uh, I've been listening to a lot recently. Tim yeah. Ferriss' podcast was always my my big go-to. I'm a huge fan of um, Peter Atia, so any, I'll always kind of Google his name and try and um, find stuff like that. So I mean, podcasts are a lot. And then the other kind of readings are, um, are more like my Google alerts. I have pretty good Google alerts set up on my Outlook. So I'll get, you know, and I have like keywords like substrate utilization, yeah. 
part, sedation, high variability, blah, 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 and they'll, and they'll be, and they'll kind of alert me. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think I'm pretty good now at, I can't say I sit down. I, like back in the day when I was a student, I'd print off a paper and read it back to back. But now <laughs> I'm kind of like, I'll download the PDF, look at my computer, zoom, 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 get the general, the general gist, and then and then save it and put it away somewhere. So, um, but yeah, and then, but um, yeah, I do enjoy a good read, especially. Um, I'm 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 into all sorts of my uh, into all sorts of books, and that's not necessarily all to do with physiology and sports performance. I'm quite into just general. So the book I'm reading at the moment is that Solve to Be Happy. Solve to oh, Happy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anchor, I can't remember his name. So that's a gives you an idea of what, what I'm just interested in stuff, really. It's awesome because that preempted my next question. I always like to ask people what other books are they reading because we can yeah. get very focused on performance, yeah, but yeah. obviously it's so not, got, not all life. <laughs> what have I got behind me right now? I've got the um, Tribe book by Sebastian Young. That's another one that's pretty good. Um, I've got another one that's called Chaos Monkey, which is about startups and um the guy who the guy who went who went from twitter to facebook and worked in silicon valley so all the just oh, wow. general general stuff general interesting books but i'm not not much of a fiction guy i have to say i did read the alchemist that's about <laughs> as far as I, I went in terms of the fiction and that's only because everyone harped on about it about how good it was so Oh, mate, I, I need to read fiction. That's my sort of my literary sleeping pill, I call it. I think I've read 30 novels so far this this year. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, good to go to that's sleep, fun. right? Hey, yeah, that's the thing. Like, so just on the sleep, I've been using, um, I have this thing called Aura Ring. Have you heard of that? Yeah, yeah. So, so it gives you, so you're supposed to work all day, but I work just to quantify my sleep. Um, yeah. Anyway tells me every morning it tells me that i'm having like 23 minutes of deep sleep <laughs> and so the part of me is thinking is that actually right but then if it is right it starts to worry me yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what are you doing anything to to try and improve your sleep uh yeah i have the ultimate bedtime routine so i will um so I'll basically i'll try and turn my phone off at about 7 30 put it on kind of airplane mode yeah um doesn't I don't always keep it off. I think, oh, I'll just do this one more thing. But yeah, so that's my aim. And then and then I'll have um, the mushroom tea. Again, that I buy from you. See, this I'm giving you too much business. The Relishi, the yoga tea. See, I didn't even realize that you were buying that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I, so I was getting the, the cacao one, but... Um, I've gone to the uh, the yoga releasey mushroom tea now. I love that stuff. It's awesome. I'm big into that as well. I have the um, I have the mushroom coffee and the mushroom um, the mushroom exciter as well. Sometimes I'm a massive fan of medicinal mushrooms, and the the more I look into it, the more of a fan I become. And I I feel a massive effect. And I I, I like to think that um, you know some of the things that I do, whether it be MCTs, ketones lion's mane they're, they're basically there to help heal my brain as well I, I don't know if you know but i've had about eight pretty serious concussions you know one of oh, them right. very serious well how did you have this what uh yeah playing rugby and boxing yeah you will do silly things exactly and so um <laughs> things can really help with neurogenesis i'm a massive fan of yeah oh yeah. that's super interesting i love to talk about that a bit more like yeah so i have the um i have the i've been getting to the 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 Relishi, is it Relishi, Relishi mushroom? Yeah, Reishi. Reishi, Reishi, sorry. Um, so I have that, and then um, I'll go to bed, and then I have a Shakti mat. Ah, right, yeah, I've got one of those. I've been doing the, uh, so I put the Shakti, and I basically I lie on the Shakti until I'm kind of half asleep, and then I'll pull it out, and then clunk. And I fall to sleep super fast. Yeah. Generally, I'll be woken up by, you know, Bella might have a bit of a, a bit of a scream at some point, but you know but yeah i fall asleep super fast so i just wonder but then it must be a little bit lighter so yeah there you go but yeah i'm pretty down with the routine and usually i'll even have a bit of um I, so more recently i've been doing the tens tens um oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. had a bit of an injury so i've been and i find i found that's been pretty relaxing as well yeah i use it a lot um 
I think it's great. And I actually, I, I use it for hypertrophy as well. And I know that a lot of people say that doesn't work, but I think if you've got a unit that you can really crank up yeah, yeah, as an adjunct to your other strength yeah. work, I think it's really effective. And particularly if you use um, the sort of hypoxic, um, the bands as well. I mean, those two things together are pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, but I was reading some stuff that it was actually, it's not all one-sided with the, um, with the with the tens and the hypertrophy, so actually, I was seeing some stuff that for strength gains and and um, hypertrophy it can be quite good. So, because yeah. I was, yeah, so I was going to use it on my because I've been having my left glute is pretty much weak, weaker than my right. So I was thinking of I've been using it ba basically for because I've had a bit of a glute med strain on the left, so I've been using it to kind of help with that. But I was thinking about cranking it up on the hypertrophy and getting my butt. Um, in some hypertrophy going on there because it's it's definitely smaller in size. Just it's small just, anyway. Just don't uh, post any YouTube videos of that, mate. No, 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 <laughs> no. I won't. I'll leave that to myself. No, no Instagram feed for that one. Exactly. Instagram stories. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so I've taken up way too much of your time and I could probably talk to you for hours, Dan, and I would love to actually get you back and talk about some of the other areas you've worked in because there's just so much there that we could mine, I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, so what, what's your, uh, before we finish off, what's next for you? Have you got any big projects coming up or anything that you're working on uh, in the business side of things at the moment? Um, so the big thing, I mean, the big thing in my mind is I'm going to, I'm racing Kona World Championships Ironman in October. Wow. So kind of, um, I've always like that's kind of my big thing of the year, really. And I'm, and then I'm going. Then my plan is that I'm going to retire for a few years until Bella gets a little bit older. She's, you know, she's she'll be worn the day after the race. So I figured that we. My plan was to do it in 2017, but you know, she was born on the same day, so. We had yeah. to move things around a bit. So, you know, my wife's amazing and she's like, oh, you have to do it next year. So um, I kind of want to tick that one off. That's that's what's going on personally. Um, and then other than that, I'm just enjoying a mix of everything that I do, really. A bit of coaching, a bit of science, um, a bit of tech, a bit of artificial intelligence stuff in the coaching space as well. So these, yeah, like I'm pretty fortunate that, you know, I don't really go, I don't feel like I have a job really because I just enjoy everything that I do so much. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of what it is. And we'll just keep publishing some papers and um, working with my students. So. And so where can people go to find out more about what you do, Dan? Um, so, yeah, we've got, um, we, have, we do have a, our own company, coaching company, which is with me and Paul Lawson, which is a, uh, cluesandprof.com so we've got a few blogs on there a lot of the stuff about what we talked about today about the fat oxidation and um and stuff like that um get me on instagram on at the plus one and you can get me on um twitter as well on at the plus one so. awesome well thanks dan uh we have a huge amount of information here to mine through and chuck up in the show notes um like i say i would love to get you back on at some stage and talk even more but thanks for being on today mate it was awesome no problem great to be here cool. thanks buddy thank you